welcome to inquiring into the empowerment of communities. Uh, first of all, we have um, impacts of discussion platforms for young people with uh, Meet Lenoir. We're, um, we're going to cut questions from these sessions, I'm afraid, just so we can keep the time and everybody can get to trains and planes and, and things like that. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Mip. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> My name is Meet Lenoir. Um, I hope you... Uh, had time to recover a bit from the last session. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about digital communities for social change, um, uh, specific, specifically a program called Citizens Voice that we uh, run at RNW Media. Uh, first of all, I'll t talk a bit about the approaches that we um, uh, have to create alternative spaces for civic action, uh, after which I'll present a bit uh, the impact that we found on users' knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. Um, is this one? So, yeah, we work in restrictive settings, which I think by now could be the entire world. <laughs> uh, but these are some of the platforms we uh, support. Um, the first one is Yaga in uh, Burundi, uh, Habari RDC in, uh, in Congo DRC, uh, Bembere in uh, Mali, uh, Huna Libya in uh, Libya, uh, Manasati 30 in uh, Yemen, and um, Justice for her, or I think in Chinese it's orange umbrella in, uh, in China. And uh, so we, we work with young people between 15 and 30 years old. And um, uh, so they are both our end users and our um, uh, uh, drivers of, uh, of the local teams, uh, who are, consist mainly uh, uh, out of um, media specialists, uh, change makers, activists. So uh, apart from uh, uh, Citizen Voice, we have two other programs called RNTC. One is, this, is a training center for uh, impact journalism, and Love Matters uh, is uh, our platforms around uh, love, sex, and relationships. Uh, we work in totally in 13 countries, and uh, of course in all different uh, contexts and all contextualized uh, programs. So when talking about um, creating uh, alternative digital uh, civic spaces, this is a bit of the, the potential that uh, digital media can, uh, can offer. Um, for, unfortunately, these are the numbers of 2017, but I think uh, in general, mostly the, the difference from 2018 is that the video views have gone up uh, incredibly. You can also see that uh, most of our traffic is through uh, social media. Uh, although all, all platforms have websites, most of the traffic that we uh, gather is uh, through uh, Facebook, actually. And uh, in, in China, it's, uh, I think, Weibo. I think this is a nice example of uh, scale. Uh, we found out last week that in uh, Burundi, one of the uh, mobile companies is actually using uh, the, the Yaga logo. You see it here? As in, in, their, in their ads. So it's, you see that it's actually bigger than the Facebook logo. <laughs> but... Um, not sure what that means. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll discuss a bit about the, our theory of change, uh, and then we, we uh, uh, delve a bit into the approaches, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about impact. So our theory of change has, has two pathways. The, one, uh, the first one focuses on creating that alternative space, specific space that I was talking about. So uh, let's start with uh, at, at, at one where we have um, uh, young people in the countries that we work um, we, who uh, live in um, restrictive settings where freedom of expression is limited, freedom of association is limited, um, digital uh, or, or public space limited. So their uh, platforms are created where they can come uh, for, from all kinds of different backgrounds. So, she, so we make sure that people uh, for across all kinds of divides uh, in Yemen, it's, it's north-south. Uh, in DRC, it's more regional. So uh, that, that, that we access that people from different um, ideologies and uh, demo uh, demographics have access to our, our platforms. Um, when they, um, it's also a matter of access to uh, pluralistic. Um, uh, pluralistic and uh, liable trusted information. So that's why they, they come and visit the platforms. Um, mostly, of course, to consume, um, but also to exchange and uh, share opinions. And our long-term outcomes that we assume and that we uh, 
are testing with uh, the research that we done. It's actually uh, to, to uh, we think that um, by by exchanging, by learning about other viewpoints and about reading maybe about different um, multiple viewpoints, um, people are more open to different viewpoints and also um, in in the long term that that we, we would love that that leads to more uh, acceptance of diversity, as well as uh, challenging restrictive norms and prejudices. And uh, so keep that in mind when I present the research, because that is actually, uh, um, yeah, that we want, want our outcomes to be. The second track is citizen feedback, because uh, of course, uh, the thousands of people that visit our platforms, uh, they they provide us with loads of information on the, the needs and the, they have, the views they have. And this information is uh, is collected, um, analyzed, um, uh, fed with other media and uh, advocacy organizations, uh, change makers, so um, to influence decision making. And we've had already quite a few examples where uh, where this was successful. For example, the Yemen platform was asked to represent Yemeni youth at the Stockholm uh, peace talks uh, at end, end of uh, 2018. Um, Yeah, so uh, this is a bit about our approach. Um, uh, I think when yesterday Alexander was talking about we need to foster more democratic societies, I think we also need to foster more inclusive societies. And I think the work we do is actually contributing, I hope, <laughs> to that. Um, so we make sure that in every, uh, in every team uh, there is a diversity of uh, backgrounds. Um, uh, inclusive tech, for example, refers to um, um, mobile first, because I think 90% of our users uh, come in via mobile. Um, it's download speeds are, are fast. Um, inclusive content is also yeah, bridging all kinds of uh, democratics and ideologies, so make sure that content is being balanced um, to not end up in an echo chamber, but that's always a challenge. Uh, these are uh, some examples of uh, um, media formats that we use. So the first on top left is, uh, is a blog. So we work with uh, highly regarded blogging platforms in uh, Mali, uh, Burundi, and um, DRC. And uh, so they use persu persuasive storytelling. The bloggers uh, use uh, a lot of also personal stories um, to, for example, talk about sensitive issues. And here I think this one is about uh, genital cutting. At the, the blog is called um, Letter to My Lost uh, Clitoris, I think. Yeah, that's the, that's the one on the right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so the, that one is, a, is an example of an infographics um, done in Yemen, so where the, the community was asked to um, give their opinion on cheating. And uh, so these are, uh, these are information is collected via surveys and then fed back into the community into using uh, uh, all kinds of infographics and forms to, um, to visualize that, that, that data. Um, on the left uh, is Amani, our first female vlogger in uh, Libya, and she, yeah, she started talking a lot about um, uh, issues that women face in, in Libya, for example, on the work, uh, workspace. This cre creates huge uh, kind of uh, debates, also sometimes very violent debates, um, but th those are moderated, and we see that the tone of voice is changing over time, so that is, I think, great progress. And then on the left, uh, right, it's an example. It's a still of a motion design video made by our team uh, uh, in Burundi, and it's actually um, uh, it's um, an explanation explanation of a prejudice or a stereotype around people from uh, Moaro, which is in the center of uh, Burundi. Uh, I think it's it's quite sensitive. They are called to be greedy, and the video is made together with a historical institute in Burundi, where. Um, it, 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 they go back to in history where this where this actually came from. So also trying to bust that stereotype. Um, yeah, moderation it means different things to different people. Um, for us, it's actually used to increase the debate, to deepen the debate also, uh, and to increase also participation of certain groups that are underrepresented. And uh, this is a nice way where you can see that the average uh, uh, Facebook uh, engagement of women is actually um, around 10%, while on, on our platform it's much higher. So uh, I think that's... A nice example. Okay, let's run into the uh, impact results. So what did we do? We did a survey um, uh, in five countries. Um, in total, uh, almost 1,000 uh, answers were, um, were analyzed. 
And um, the question that we asked was an open question. So can you give an example of a way in which your perspective or your uh, opinion has changed through reading or engaging with the platform? Um, the methodology was, yeah, we, we are all uh, uh, um, practitioners. So uh, I did this together with my colleague from Yemen, who I would love to have on the screen, but unfortunately that was not possible because I wanted to, uh, um, to Skype him in. <laughs> Um, for the um, colleague from China and from uh, Egypt and from the Netherlands. Uh, so we did uh, qualitative coding. Uh, we made sure there was a second coder for each project. And we found a core group of sim similar kind of uh, types of change. And uh, the types of change we found were actually much broader, I think, than we expected. And there are specifics of for each country re re um, reflecting their, uh, their context. Um, so we found that 84% actually reported a change, um, and the biggest change they reported had to do with um, more openness to different viewpoints. Um, this also included answers that were talking about that they're now less prejudiced, uh, that they now more aware of uh, discrimination and how to act against that. Um, it's maybe that has to do also because some of the platforms have quite a lot of content about a marginalized group, for example, in Yemen uh, about the war machine, in um, uh, Libya, the, the Amazi, um, in the DRC in Burundi, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, content about albinos. Um, knowledge turned out to be a big uh, change. Some people reporting, we now have more access to either a more, more trusted information or different information or um, pluralistic information. Um, Sorry, and then, and then have increased uh, knowledge around these kind of uh, topics like political situation, minorities or gender issues. A smaller group reported uh, behavior change. They were talking about uh, they now are better able to express themselves or more open to express themselves uh, or, or skills, having more um, improved communication or um, analysis, critical thinking skills. So uh, a little bit into the different types. So the first one, access to pluralistic information. I think that's where everything kind of uh, starts. Uh, by having access to information, uh, you can increase your awareness. You can change your attitudes. And uh, these are some of the, the answers that we got from the different uh, countries. Then uh, more awareness. So this is also re reflecting to the, I think the, the, the right image actually doesn't, doesn't uh, reflect the, uh, uh, the answer. But uh, on the left, you can see the, the Moaro video again. So the, the people talk, talking about how they um, now understand, for example, certain uh, cultural th uh, issues um, better. Um, Attitude change, these are examples uh, that we got from, uh, yeah, for example, the, the person in Burundi is talking about how um, he or she is now realizes the importance of listening. Um, and that also, already, I think that was also coded as an, a skill, a better communication skill. Um, more open to express oneself. Um, so this is not only actually being more interested in to, 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 to share opinions or feeling more, feeling more free, but there was also people saying actually that they now feel a need, uh, a bigger need to express themselves where before they might have not spoken up, they now see they, they, uh, they should and they, and they will do. Um, then some specifics. So uh, Burundi had a few uh, categories like improved communication skills. So um, people saying that um, I used to be, I used not to be able to have a conversation with someone that I disagree with. And now when I see the bloggers, how they kind of uh, speak and, and also the moderators, actually platforms are, are heavily moderated, how, how, how discussions are, are, are kept in a constructive way. Uh, this actually also reflects in, the, in their answers. And another, I think, uh, a nice one is a more positive views on Burundians. People saying that, um, yeah, for example, uh, uh, talking about um, uh, entrepreneurship, um, uh, creativity. So they, there's a lot of content on uh, people like uh, Divine on the on the on the picture, who is a portrait artist. So very very um, inspiring and insp uh, aspirational uh, content. Um, DRC, yeah, this is an example of uh, improved uh, analytical skills. So people saying that they're now be better able to um, address situation from different angles um, and that before drawing conclusions. Uh, also, um, people mentioned that they now uh, check several sources or that they don't trust the first thing that they read. 
and they go look for more information on a certain issue. And in Yemen, yeah, like I mentioned, there was this, there's quite a lot of uh, attention that the team there uh, paid to more machine and uh, also changing stereotypes around that uh, group. And that is also reflected back in the answers. And then China is a bit special uh, because China has a, a different uh, kind of uh, target group. The people there uh, that we uh, have on our platform are female migrant workers. And the content focuses on um, uh, gender-based violence and also uh, uh, worker rights. And there we see also more, I think, more nuanced kind of answers. Um, people talking about being more aware of, uh, of issues, but also a, a, a smaller group saying that they now understand that they were not the victim of, uh, of uh, that they, it was not their fault as being a victim of gender-based violence, which, yeah, every time I read it, it gives me goosebumps. And um, a, a, another quote from, from that uh, sample was um, actually an example where um, uh, someone realizes that domestic violence is, is not normal. So um, is, is actually is a restrictive norm that actually is being, people are being aware that this is not normal. So it's kind of a first step to, to, to change your attitude around that and to maybe uh, act differently. And uh, I'm not sure if I can go back. Yeah, so um, here in, in the China um, uh, sample, we also saw pe people talking about they now would, would act against violence or they would stand up for others who actually are a victim of violence or they would say no to, to has harassment. Um, so that, that's kind of showing a, a kind of behavioral shift. But um, yeah. I, I, I don't know, I, I, I didn't kind of, I, don't, I didn't want to conclude this, so this is my final slide. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, but we don't have time anymore for the question, but uh, maybe we can talk about it afterwards. So how to, how to um, uh, give meaning to this? So, because, uh, and there's also some questions that I had for you actually prepared, but we don't have time also for that, but maybe later on with a drink. So I would love to hear more about which experience you have for tracking offline impact of online interventions, and what other quantitative methods you see to, to measure, to demonstrate uh, changes in attitudes and behavior, um, given that our user base constantly changes. So people aren't around for, quite, for a long time, maybe a few months, maybe a few times only. Uh, so it's difficult to do a baseline, endline kind of uh, measurement. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. First, it sounds like you found the secret source to engaging young people, and I'm sure there are people at my society that would like to hear more about that. Um, next, I'd like to welcome to the stage Luke Jordan. Hello. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi. It's the uh, it's that session where there's the coffee only just arrived, and it's just it's like an hour and a half after lunch, and everybody's falling asleep, including me. So I'm going to do this walking around thing with the mic, because if I'm at the lectern, I don't trust myself to stay awake. Um, presentation up or not. Ah, oh, there you go. OK. Um, so grassroots. Um, and my apologies for people who are in the session this morning. Um, some of this will be repetitive. Um, but as a brief sort of summary, uh, Grassroot is, we're an organization in South Africa. We deploy mobile-first tools that enable community organizing via pretty much any kind of phone, um, from feature phones to low-spec smartphones with limited data, um, through to more complex devices when people have them. Uh, we were launched in late 2015, early 2016, um, and we've now reached over 350,000 people with over 30,000 activities um, called through it, and that rate continuing to grow at about 5 to 10% a month, um, almost entirely through organic word of mouth. Um, on the surface, and this will be the main subject of the talk, kind of on the surface, our metrics look very strong. So we did surveys of users, and when, you ask, when we ask users, um, can you talk about changes that you've seen in your community, um, we have two-thirds of users saying they've seen a significant change in quality of life. When we look at things like viral metrics, how likely are people to recommend the tools to other people, 
Um, our scores on that are near um, some of the best in the industry. Um, and we have stories of first level impact. Um, the challenge comes in, and I notice that there's going to be an aspect problem, so half the text, some text won't be visible. But we've, in the last six months, as we've started to dig quite deeply into um, what's actually happening in a way through really quite forensic qualitative research, um, we've actually found that as good as some of the sur surface metrics are, at a deeper level, some of the impact is not really flowing through. And what that means is that our theory of change, um, which I'll talk about, um, is quite probably broken. Um, and that leaves us with a question, which is, OK, so what do we do now um, when we've built on a whole bunch of assumptions which turn out to be wrong, and it's not clear where we might go next? So. Um, Here's the context, and I'll go through the first slides a bit quickly and then dwell a bit more about where things are um, failing. So the problems that we're trying to solve are first, it's very costly and difficult for the poor to organize themselves. Um, and one example of that is in South Africa, um, if you wanted to hold a community meeting, um, you had to hire somebody to drive around in the back of a truck with a megaphone telling everybody when the meeting would happen. Um, and of course, most people wouldn't hear that, and a lot of people would, um, would not turn up, and it's expensive and time consuming. Um, and those can be multiplied. And the second thing is that it's too hard for local leaders to access information that they can act on and also to connect to each other in a meaningful way to start aggregating and trying to create systemic change. So, why do we solve them? Sorry, the text is all messed up, but anyway. Um, first, South Africa does have the full panoply of institutions that democratic theory says, once activated by engaged citizens, should lead to responsiveness and accountability. I mean, we have the entire works. From formal elections through to an independent press, independent judiciary, we have performance monitoring and the bureaucracy, we have legislation for participatory budgeting, we have legislation for participatory performance targeting, every single thing that according to formal theory should lead to accountability if people activate and use it is present. Second, South Africa has a long tradition of collective action in the struggle against apartheid. And today has extremely high levels of dissatisfaction and, and anger, resulting in some of the highest levels of per capita protest, um, although often disaggregated and small scale protest uh, in the world. So we had, and this is what led into the sort of theory, we had these two things saying, well, on the one hand, we have all of these formal institutions. On the other hand, we have all of this ground up anger we can channel one into the other through collective action, this should lead to significant change. So in order to pursue that, what we did was we created simple tools for mobile phones. Um, we designed very closely with our users. So we are half field work, half uh, software development. Um, we built a set of tools um, that allow people to do things like Recruit a whole lot of people, call a meeting, ask for volunteers, um, call a vote, um, issue a press alert, issue a safety alert, etc. And to do these things using very simple menu-based flows on any kind of phone. Um, and we did that through spending months at a time understanding a problem before we touch a line of code and by having a field team that fed back very directly into our development team and vice versa. So what that led to was that after two years, we had a platform that without pretty much any marketing budget or much marketing at all, um, was able to achieve um, quite rapid increases in engagement and quite sustained increases in engagement. So somebody this morning talked about sort of initial bumps of use and then fall off. We've seen a kind of continually climbing curve. Um, about 80% of growth has been driven by word of mouth. Um, and people would report things like two to twofold increases in meeting attendance and frequency in communities using our tools. Um, and we'd see over 2,000 activities a month flowing through, that's meetings, votes, et cetera, across our user base. Um, as an example of stories, this is Abath Lali Basam Jondolo, um, which means the people who live in shacks. Um, one of the uh, most vibrant and I think widely known social movements in South Africa. Um, they grew from 14,000 to just over 50,000 members um, over a period of three years. Um, they use Grassroot for quite a bit of that organizing activity. 
as I'll mention later, or I would have mentioned in Q&A, they give us more credit than I think we take for what they've done. But um, they use us in ways that um, help them organize at that scale and grow it on that basis. Um, they are currently involved in, uh, they are being targeted by oppressive violence and various other forms um, of repression, but they are a strong and growing movement. Um, overall, uh, that curve's actually already outdated, um, but sort of activity's been, you, engagement and activity has been growing really rapidly, and we've now started to be used in large-scale campaigns. Um, so part of the, one of the set tools in the, in the suite is the ability to do change.org or move-on type petitions through very basic phones um, and connect that to new methods of awareness raising, um, in order to trigger large numbers of, of, of inbound engagement and then convert that into things like WhatsApp voice notes and other media that can then be tr brought into policy spaces. Um, so all of that activity has kind of been undergoing and, and happening. And actually just last week, uh, various things happened that really re resulted in another 30, 40,000 people coming on. So that's all happening. But then, doubt. So, uh, and this is where I'll spend a bit more of the time. Um, in the last six months, what we started to do, because we started off, as I right now, it's about three and a half, three, three and a half years ago. And throughout the initial couple of years, we kept saying it's too early to look for deep impact. It's too early. It's too early. We're working on changes in collective action, which are going to result in changes in governance, which are going to result in changes in outcomes. That's a very long time horizon kind of activity. That measurement is quite difficult. So it's too early. It's too early. It's too early. And then six months ago, we started saying it's not too early anymore. We need to go and start looking at what's actually happening. And we had the survey results, but we said for various reasons, I guess it's just congenital self-doubt and pessimism. Um, we uh, we just decided, well, we're not entirely sure if we trust this. So what we did was we went through and we conducted interviews with just over a dozen of the communities that have been working at, with us. And when I say forensic interviews, I mean three, four hour long interviews, really trying to understand in great detail what exactly is happening, what are the dynamics of organizing. Um, and in all of them, what we found was a similar cycle. So what we found is that there would be an initial phase of collective action increasing and picking up. There would be some initial response from the state, uh, the response would stop, and then for various other internal reasons, the collective action would fall apart. Um, and this is a cycle that existed before we were there, of course, um, but our, our tools and what we were doing was not breaking that cycle, it was accelerating it, so it might be increasing the amplitude and sort of decreasing the frequency, but it was not actually breaking the cycle. Um, which means that an increasing density of organizing is not leading to effectiveness, which is the link that we have presumed. Um, and of course, just to be clear on realism, um, you know, we didn't assume like, oh, we'll build this USSD meeting call and everybody will sing Kumbaya and the government will start re responding to everybody. It was, we were always realistic that this was a case of shifting at the margin um, and that maybe we'd see sort of where we had, where, where there had been kind of Nothing had been feeding through into response. Maybe we get 10%, maybe we get to 20% or 30%. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is actually somewhat more serious than that. And why we're seeing it as we've dug down is, and this is still a process that's un ongoing, but we've seen three sort of interlocking causes for why, despite massively reduced transaction costs for collective action um, and a clear motivation to do it, um, still, there's not this feed through into impact. And the three are unemployment institutions and ideas. And there's quite a lot in here, but to kind of talk through each of them. The first one is, so South Africa has 30% unemployment, um, and roughly 40% of the population is dependent on income grants. Um, so as an aside, anybody who thinks an automated future with basic income grants looks good, uh, please come and look at South Africa. Um, because we are that future to a significant extent. Um, and what happens in those conditions of unemployment is any additional income opportunity is extremely valuable. Um, and being a community leader creates those sort of opportunities. Um, and it can do what, so in ways that are not directly corrupt. They're just in the nature of operating in that sort of environment and having that kind of precarious, highly resource-constrained life. So when, and this particularly happens when external NGOs or government departments come in and run projects in these kind of communities, it's well known 
that when that happens, whoever can plausibly say, I am a community leader, is going to have access to certain kinds of income generation. Um, second is when you have that level of unemployment, you have uh, long-term planning and thinking becomes very difficult to entrench. It's not difficult to do, but it's difficult to make a habit. Um, and it's also, there are a few productive channels to, for energy because people generally have very few um, productive activities. Um, and so that energy often turns inward into suspicion and dispute. Um, and then that's exacerbated by the fact that any source of income, because no source of a, sources of income are formal, any source of income is, can be a potential cause of suspicion. Institutions, um, so South Africa, the, our institutions of local government, particularly despite all of the laws, um, it's almost a case study of how legislation can be entirely meaningless um, or close to. Um, the structure of how political power is distributed and allocated through constitutional provisions around institutions, around control of powers, around electoral cycles, um, means that almost universally most of the provisions are ignored and unresponsiveness is basically structural. Um, what that particularly means in practice is that there's an occasional response to a first message and none thereafter because all of the incentives that any local bureaucrat or politician faces are all inward facing. Um, as one of our community leaders said it, uh, they look at your letter and say, oh, you have money to buy ink, that's nice, I have money for a dustbin. Um, the final point is that within uh, in ideas, um, within these community structures, there are not that many new narratives or ideas of what it means to actually be on these com communities and committees. So anybody familiar with Marshall Ganz's work about public narratives and stories of self and, and us and now, um, there's very few of those kinds of stories besides being on the committee, which is a very shallow base for really in, um, uh, taking forward deep uh, collective action of the kind required to create change. Um, what ideas and narratives they are come from, um, frankly, very archaic Marxist academics who still live in the South African kind of university ecosystem and run sort of workshops. So you have a lot of community leaders who can't really talk about current challenges or sustaining the, that, but can talk very eloquently about sort of means of production and class struggle. Um, and then finally, officials and councillors often have a lot of discursive tools to render things um, illegitimate. Often this is taken from technocratic discourse around things like data and so on. So it's very much like the only, there, there are whole kind of uh, projects that basically exist to try and prove to officials that an informal settlement that has no toilets would like toilets. And there's a whole kind of thing of sort of people say, officials saying, well, your data is non-representative. How do we know that actually this community that has no toilets wants toilets? Um, so where does that leave us in terms of our road out? Uh, we're currently not sure. Um, we know that in terms of unemployment, some micro practices, um, details of how the communities are structured, how meetings run, how um, committees are elected, um, can actually contain and channel energy and enable people to overcome these problems. Um, but so far the evidence we have is a bit anecdotal and possibly only in some context, but we're investigating it forward. Uh, institutions, we are running a campaign at the moment to enable uh, recall uh, provisions for local councillors to at least start to break some of those incentives. Um, and then after that one, we'll move on to something like citizen juries or sortition or other more radical changes that would actually require pretty deep restructuring of our constitution, um, which is both a perilous exercise and something where we're not sure if any social force we can see has the energy to make that possible, but we think it's almost certainly necessary. Um, and then under ideas, there are forms of sort of what we call pedagogy, deep training, idea development that might be possible. Again, there are sort of activist schools that we don't think do very much, but there might be new ways of, say, developing things based on WhatsApp, um, that are based on group discussion, media dis, um, distribution, that might have a shot at that. So overall, we're kind of coming out to say we probably need quite deep um, reimagining in practice of what the constitution of a democracy looks like in South Africa, um, and a high-risk, large-scale attempt to uh, conduct new forms of pedagogy. Um, I will say, that um, some of our funders have been amazing in their ability to withstand us going through this level of self-rigor, uh, not, not all. Um, so there's some question around both that and kind of wider patterns of discussion of having the tolerance to go through these sort of exercise and try, try things that are very difficult and different and new. Um, so, conclusion. Um, oh, and that is, uh, you can't read that text, but anyway. Um, 
So, I mean, there's a kind of, there's a side of the story which says rapid, sustained, and near viral engagement is possible um, if technology is built well. Um, and large numbers of people may consider that technology useful. Um, but even uptake and sort of people self-reporting usefulness uh, may not be immune to rigorous self-querying, uh, even with a theory of change that's articulated on some foundational ideas of democratic accountability. Um, some responses to this might be a narrowing of ambition, kind of find something smaller that you can measure and report on and, and so on. We, we don't say that that's not always, that in general that's a problem, but it's just congenitally, I think temperamentally, not something that we find as a possible or viable or attractive path. Um, but in something that's much more ambitious and wider ranging, there is some question of kind of um, what is the role of civic tech if one is considering a movement to restructure what democratic constitutions look like in South Africa or elsewhere. Is that a civic tech project? Or are we jamming tech into something that's actually fundamentally very political? Um, so we don't know. Um, and I guess I'm just going to conclude by saying, and this was a phrase somebody gave me, a mentor gave me recently, there's no real conclusion here of the form that you see a bit often these days, which is kind of inequality is soaring, the planet is crumbling, the political class is decayed, democracy is under tech. So hey, let's pass an antitrust law. Um, the roads out are pretty narrow and difficult and unclear. Um, but that also might just be because we haven't thought it all through. So I guess we don't have Q&A, but during drinks and coffee and everything afterwards, if anybody has any ideas for what can lead us out of this um, path and also the kind of experiments that we're starting to run, any advice for those, we'd be more than welcome to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. And finally, Natalia Domagala. Massacring, massacring names all over the place this week. Um, is there a clicker? Great. Sorry, it doesn't work. Oh. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, staying with us for this session. Um, I just want to start with... Um, a uh, short disclaimer, this is going to be slightly different from the two previous sessions that um, you've just seen, because I don't actually work for any of the organizations I'm talking about. So I entered this space as an impartial researcher, and uh, I will share my findings uh, related to the empowerment of women through open data and civic tech ICT skills programs. So first, let's start with the obvious. It is common knowledge that empower, empower, empowering women sorry, creates wider socioeconomic benefits for the countries. And technology is often seen as a tool to support this empowerment. However, globally, women have much less access and control over ICTs. And this leads to them being economically marginalized. And if this digital divide is not addressed, the problem will unfortunately get even worse. Now, digital skills and technology do have a potential to empower women and create high-skilled human capital. The question is, to what extent and how do we do it? So the projects I looked, I looked at um, are based in Kosovo. It's Girls Coding Kosovo and Open Data Kosovo. Girls Coding Kosovo started as a grassroots initiative because the founder, a woman working in the ICT sector in Kosovo, Blair Tatati, saw that um, there, is a, there is a big gap between the number of women who attend ICT studies and the number of women who actually work in the industry. So she was curious, why is that? And whether she, as a woman working in the industry, can do anything about it. So initially, it started as a very informal space for women to meet over coffee and just discuss their challenges. And um, for the past two, two and a half years, they have actually been running ICT skills programs with the use of open data. And um, some of the programs they have conducted are, for example, Tech for Policy, which takes uh, groups of women developers, teaches them ICT skills, and then pairs them up with their local munici municipalities to design digital solutions that are needed in their cities. Another uh, project is Code for Mitrovica, which brings young women from um, Serbian and Albanian sides of the divided city and uh, using ICT skills makes them design solutions, digital solutions for their city together. So my overall question was, again, to what extent do such grassroots ICT skills programs 
actually empower women in Kosovo. Now, empowerment is a little bit of a buzzword, isn't it? And um, I was looking at it from a very academic perspective. And uh, some of the definitions I found were okay, like this one, but not necessarily very practical if you want to look at it from a researcher's perspective. So um, having established that empowerment is first, a very fuzzy concept, second, a multidimensional process, very relational, very context dependent. So what empowers one person doesn't necessarily empower other people. And uh, it constantly changes, constantly evolves. So what I did was um, merging of two frameworks that I found in the academic literature, tracking the types of empowerment and the process. And um, in my actual research paper, I looked at all four of them. Here, I will only focus on the political slash civic empowerment, which um, basically, in the literature, the, the knowledge that I found is that ICT trainings can provide information and bring women together, thus supporting their civic empowerment. However, I know for us being here at the Civic Technology Conference, it's, it's pretty obvious that there is a very explicit link between civic and technology. However, that's not usually the case. So one of the challenges is how do we actually engage the ICT, IT communities into um, civic and political engagement? And again, many tech-enabled communities have been criticized in the academic literature as disconnected from governmental practices. So you might ask, why focus on Kosovo out of all places, right? Well, the answer is that Kosovo is a very unique case. It's the youngest country in Europe, both demographically and historically. It's, um, it's very poor. It's currently the poorest country in Europe. And um, it has many problems. So it's a very young democracy, still relatively politically unstable. It has... Um, big problem with youth and female unemployment. And um, the challenge um, in Kosovo is how do we actually use the workforce and the skills that are present, considering that um, there aren't really natural resources and um, people from Kosovo have trouble going abroad. It's very hard for them to get visas to go anywhere. So uh, basically, the country is very problematic. That's why I think... It is a very good example because here, ICT skills, civic tech, and open data can really change things probably more than in other contexts. So the methodology I used was qualitative because um, as I've already said, empowerment is quite a difficult concept to measure, particularly in a quantitative way. So I interviewed people from Girls Coding Kosovo and Open Data Kosovo and um, what I um, found, which is, I will come back to this later, but basically five of the organizers who currently work for either of the organizations used to be participants, which I think is quite interesting as well, this small scale retention. So what I found is that unfortunately, disempowerment of women in Kosovo is really uh, prevalent. So here you have a few um, key points. So traditional divisions of gender roles and cultural constraints um, are unfortunately the biggest challenge in Kosovo still. Women are actively discouraged from working at all in the most extreme cases, and particularly from working in the ICT sector. So more than half of um, women I spoke to were explicitly told that ICT is not for them because they are women. They, uh, once they get into the industry, they often see their skills being undermined. For example, I spoke to a, a very young 23-year-old uh, woman who developed her own app. And she was presenting her work at a conference with her co-founder, also a very young female um, programmer. And they were asked by, uh, by a group of men, so uh, where are the guys who developed this product? And when they said, well, it was us, we made this, we are programmers. The, the men were really skeptical and they kept on asking them really specific questions that only someone who actually developed the app will know. So um, this is very direct discrimination that they have, to, um, they have to face. There is also subtle discrimination. So once they do get into the industry, 
they often get allocated administrative roles or softer, soft skills, more artistic, let's say, roles. For example, a few participants, uh, my research participants, complained that it, it was just assumed that they would deal with uh, design and um, front-end development rather than back-end development that they actually wanted to do just because they're female. And as a woman, you're supposed to have a preference for aesthetics and design, apparently. So um, these are the, the, the three key problems. Another thing is that um, in Kosovo, women have a relative lack of exposure to, to the ICT in contrast to men. So they're not socialized because of those cultural constraints. They're not socialized to engage with ICT from a very young age the way that men are. Now, uh, very briefly, um, technological empowerment that I found in my study is basically the fact that uh, women gain skills that are very, very desired in the labor market and are really hard to get because um, as my participants complained, the quality of higher education in Kosovo is not great. So courses like the courses provided by Girls Code in Kosovo actually bridge this skills gap between university and industry. And um, again, they employ uh, some of their participants, which creates a small scale labor market empowerment. They also match some of the participants with available jobs in the industry. Courses are free, which I believe is really important especially considering that um, most of the women are young and are still trying to launch their careers, so wouldn't necessarily have the funds to, to upskill. And um, participants become fluent in open data, which is something that Girls Code in Kosovo and Open Data Kosovo use a lot. And uh, in terms of social and psychological empowerment, just really quickly, the fact that there is this tight community of women really helps counterbalance the unfavorable social norms. And they gain motivation and confidence. Uh, Blerta, who's the head of both organizations, she is a real role model to the younger women, which I think, again, shows them that one day they can be in her space. And um, some of the women I spoke to uh, were telling me that uh, getting enrolled on those courses was actually a real life-changing experience because having graduated with an ICT degree, they, they couldn't find any jobs because they didn't have relevant skills. And they were losing hope and they, they can't leave their country because the visa situation is tough. So actually having an opportunity to gain these kind of skills for free in a very welcoming space is something that um, did improve their mental well-being and quality of life overall. And um, finally, civic and political empowerment. So through data-driven projects um, in the civic tech space, Open Data Kosovo and Girls Coding Kosovo create a platform for young women to engage in their municipalities in an active way. So they become the producers of technology rather than being the consumers of technology. And some of the women I spoke to coming from the ICT background said that they never really had an interest in their local affairs and through getting to use open data through, through getting more engaged with this transparency agenda, they actually became more involved in what's going on in their municipalities. So for example, one of them said that before she didn't even know that her municipality has a website and that there is anything she can do for this website. But after the programs, she actually went on the website a few times and because she thought it was quite badly designed, she offered that she can just redo it for free just because she, she thinks it should be more accessible to further engage this kind of participation. So what I discovered in the case of Kosovo was that open data became quite an important link between the ICT communities and the civic communities because it, it gives uh, people from the tech industry a reason to actually care about what's going on in the civic space. Um, so there we go. Bringing, just bringing women together is basically insufficient in some cases. And um, here, the fact this active role of women, the fact that they actually got to meet their municipality officials, that they sat down and discussed together what is needed in their cities and what kind of digital solutions can be, can be made, this uh, was really helpful in terms of 
showing them that they can play an active role in this space and that they can have a more important role in the industry and in the local civic community. Um, again, although they are doing a great work as an independent researcher, I also felt that this is my duty to assess some limitations of those programs. And um, really quickly, the empowerment happens only for a certain group. So the programs are mainly for women who do have some sort of ICT skills background. It's not um, exclusively for women with this kind of background, but that's just the way um, it, it usually is. Um, and the courses are advertised on social media, which also means that it attracts women who are, you, who are already empowered enough to actually have access to social media. Uh, so again, uh, there is a problem with targeting ethnic minorities here. So empowerment does happen, but not for all. Uh, now, programs are complementary to existing skills. It's not, uh, it's not required to have the ICT skills background, but um, again, they're usually quite advanced, the, the issues that are being taught. And um, the employment assistance they provide is quite limited because they, um, there isn't really a scheme or an internship program associated with Girls Code in Kosovo and Open Data Kosovo. It's basically, if they hear of some jobs that are relevant, then they help and, and match women with those jobs. But it's not uh, as big a part of a program that it could be. But again, perhaps that's something they're looking to um, develop in the future. And um, in terms of open data, which um, is quite a big tool to, to stimulate this interest and civic engagement. In terms of a general public, uh, the lack of it and the lack of, um, the, the knowledge of open data is really, is really poor and the awareness of it is quite low in Kosovo overall. And um, again, as much as women become more interested in and empowered within the civic sphere, so for example, fixing what's wrong in our city, that doesn't necessarily transfer into their higher political engagement, which I think in countries um, that are like Kosovo, young and relatively unstable democracies would, um, would be quite good if there was a way to link that to a higher political engagement. And um, finally, this is um, a rather complicated uh, diagram or two diagrams that I made in order to map what uh, they are doing and what kind of benefits and types of empowerment it creates. But in a nutshell, what happened in Kosovo is combining technology, people and open data for a broader social good. So the main problems that they had prior to starting the programs was um, the lack of digital infrastructure in governments, particularly local governments, having a large group of women uh, without the appropriate skills and, um, and perhaps with relatively low interest in civic matters. Uh, so what they did was to train this community of women to actually be able to build the digital infra infrastructure that the cities need and, uh, and get more involved in the civic and political matters. And um, there are a few overall policy implications that I think could be used in implementing similar programs. So first, open data and ICT skills um, trainings should be deployed as complementary tools for upskilling their workforce. So if there is a really good civic tech ec ecosystem, then open data is not necessarily as important. But if there is a, a gap between technology uh, community and uh, civic political community, open data can be a very good and effective bridge to actually connect the two. And, um, in the case of Kosovo, the ICT skills trainings provided a very neutral space for people from two communities that historically don't necessarily get on. So the, the program Code for Mitrovica brought women from Serbian and Albanian parts of the city together in one room, uh, working in groups uh, to, to think of what are the solutions they could develop together to, develop, uh, to, to help their city. So again, this is something that could be used particularly in the case of younger generations in some spaces um, with, um, with community tensions. But again, it's no silver bullet, so don't, don't take it 
um, as gospel. And um, in order for this kind of programs to benefit long term, uh, to produce long term benefits for women, unfortunately, what we have to do is to overcome the cultural constraints and the subtle discrimination and the direct discrimination. And um, unfortunately, we can organize as many um, upskilling initiatives as possible, but um, without a broader and long-term cultural change, I don't know to what extent it will actually empower women. Thank you very much.